Illinois, Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Um, you know, as has been remarked, there's a near-term emergency to get the $60 billion in military assistance to Ukraine. And separate from that, there remains a longer-term need for reconstruction assistance to Ukraine, uh, which the World Bank estimates is somewhere north of $400 billion. Now, at the start of the Russian invasion, the free democracies of the world uh, froze um, roughly $300 billion in Russian currency assets, primarily at European banks and, and financial institutions. And the Biden administration and many of our allies have recently taken the stance that those assets should be leveraged somehow to provide re reconstruction resources to Ukraine. I, I support this concept, and I believe that additional action should be taken uh, to ensure that we hold Russia accountable. But there are real concerns on the impact that this might have on central banking system, on the primacy of the dollar, the euro, um, and, and so on. And so my question is, have you seen just the act of, of freezing these assets and not seizing them, but simply freezing them, have you seen deleterious effects on, on the the primacy of the dollar, the confidence in the central banking system. Is there any visible downside from the act of freezing that's visible so far in the two years since we've done it? I, I can't point to any. Um, I, okay. I can't point to any. Okay, so that's a, that's an interesting observation when we think of taking the additional step of, of actually seizing them, that at least so far, because you know, to my mind, having them frozen is as violent as um, and, and as violent as, as seizing them outright. And so that's interesting that so far we haven't seen that. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the Basel III and, and, and so on, um, there is a, um, uh, there's a frustration I've had over the fact that directionally the effects of these are clear, but the magnitude of effects are not. You know, for example, if you talk about the, the effect on uh, the prices seen by derivative end users of increased capital requirement, uh, directionally it's clear. If you raise capital requirements, banks will withdraw from these markets to some extent. Other players will step in partly and take up part of the slack, and the spreads will increase and so on. Um, well, is the data that you've collected enough uh, for you to actually estimate the magnitude of these effects instead of simply the direction? I, I think it's really hard to get down to the micro level and, and try to assess that because you're right, there would be multiple effects. But you, you do know that you, you know the direction, you know what so, the sign that, is. That's right, but you, yeah. know, the, you know, if you can avoid financial crises with a microscopic uh, increase in prices seen by end users, that's one thing. If it's a very large uh, difference in the price, so that the magnitude matters a lot when you're doing these balancing things. And, and a lot of it depends on, actually, you need a model for how the different market players will react. And is that really not going to be in the scope of the analysis that you anticipate from the so I, quantitative? I, I do, I believe we have done some work on that. And I think the banks and other participants have done work on that as well and come up with a range of answers. But it, it you know, this is a, I mean, there are just an awful lot of variables in these equations, so it's hard to say with any confidence. It's, I mean, that's why it's, 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 uh, it's hard to, the job of deciding the precise level of appropriate capital is, uh, is a hard one. Yeah. Um, and now with, uh, you know, with 10 years, we've had two major crises uh, with both a fiscal uh, and a monetary response. Um, are there the lessons that you can learn now that, you know, I believe and it seems like your testimony indicates that we're kind of approaching back to normal now? And we've seen um, in the crisis of 15 years ago, uh, we saw what many people thought was an inadequate fiscal response, that the fiscal response was, you know, less than half of the output gap. Um, and we limited by political, um, you know, political will to do things. And then, of course, you were limited by the zero bound in, in what you could do for most of a decade, and we had a long recovery. Um, and the comparison you know, to the recent, the COVID recovery has been very sharp, and it's quite remarkably put us right back on that track. Are there any lessons that you've sort of drawn about the, the importance of the, the getting the right balance of fiscal and monetary response to these, these shocks? Um, so we think about that. A lot, uh, and, and I, I think it's, it, I have to say, I have to start by saying it's too soon to really tell because the answers you would give today, the picture looks very different than what it looked like a year ago. And so 
uh, and a year from now, we'll be looking back going and saying, we've learned so much more. So I think we, the, the pandemic is still writing the story of our economy right now, and we should just be prepared to be surprised with the next chapter, as we were with, with 2023, the very strong growth, the sharp decline in, in inflation while the labor market remained very strong. Gentlemen's very few forecasters expired. had that, but we can talk about it. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to the